could I present you with an image to begin with? The first serious public discussion of the themes of this synod took place last February at a meeting of the Consistory of Cardinals to which I was admitted as a newly nominated cardinal. I said after that, the discussion there had been like an overture. It was something that signalled many of the themes that would be developed in due course. So it moved quickly from theme to theme. This extraordinary synod, I would like to suggest to you, is a first movement of a piece of music. Only a first movement. What will happen after this synod, there will be a second movement, and that will be the 12 months in between the two synods of bishops. Now, those of you who know classical music format, second movements are often more meditative. They're quieter. They're to be listened to perhaps more intently. And I think what goes on throughout the church worldwide in between these two synods is a very important part of the overall composition. The third movement, which as you know, is often quite dramatic, will be the Ordinary Synod in October 2015. That will be attended by elected members of bishops' conferences. And then, in musical terms, there'll be a finale, which will be whatever the Holy Father concludes if this synod follows the normal pattern. So in due course, there will be an apostolic exhortation, such as Evangelium, Evangelii Gaudium, and that will express the mind of the church through the Pope on the matters that have been talked about. So it, it, it's very important that we understand where this extraordinary synod sits in the whole process that the Catholic Church worldwide is embarking on. And I give you that musical analogy just to kind of put it in a familiar context. I'd now like just to highlight three points, three themes, which I think have emerged quite strongly in the reflection over the last 10, 12 months or so in the life of the church, which I certainly have very much in mind as I go to the Synod, and which I think you will recognize. I mean, the first is the way in which the gift of God's mercy has come so much to the fore in the life and the language and the reflection and the prayer of the church. I mean, this is something that Pope Francis showed would be his emphasis from the very first words that he has spoken. I don't think it's new. I grew up very firmly in a church that understood itself as a church of sinners. Uh, I don't think it's been our strong suit in the last 30 years. And I think what Pope Francis is calling for is a return to that lived sense of the mercy and compassion of God who always accompanies us. So I think one of the challenges, one of the invitations that we face is finding ways of creating a culture of mercy in the church. But I think we also need to be clear that there is a distinction between that culture of mercy and the acts that are necessary in our understanding of God's mercy working out the actions that are necessary for forgiveness and conversion. So I put it like this. Mercy is the air we are to breathe. Forgiveness and conversion are the pathway we are to walk. It would be a mistake to confuse those two, to say that somehow the gift of God's mercy removes the need for acts of forgiveness and conversion. But it would also be a mistake to think that forgiveness and conversion are not enabled and enriched and made possible within a culture of mercy. So for me, 
Mercy is to be the air we breathe, what fills our lungs day by day. And forgiveness and conversion is the path that everybody, starting with me, we have to try and take each day, walk each day. Now, a second point, which I think has been coming more and more to the fore in different discussions, in different publications, is a need to grasp again, refresh, deepen what the church's understanding of marriage as a sacrament really is. And I think that has been uh, lost sight of somewhat uh, for all sorts of reasons. But it, it really does need to come back to the fore that a marriage in the Catholic understanding, when it is embraced in the right intention and spirit and form, is an act of God. And the husband and wife become ministers of God's grace to each other. And if we can explore that and understand that, then it it helps us to, to see why there is such a desire to embrace the indissolubility of marriage. Because it, it is the work of God that we're talking about. So if I could put it very sharply, a marriage that is truly the place of the conscious, willing acceptance of God's grace can no more be dissolved than the Eucharist can be returned to ordinary bread because it is the work of God. Now, we also, with Pope Francis especially, are being asked to look again and again and again at the frailty of the human reality, which is, in the classical sense, the matter of the sacrament, the, 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 the created reality through which God works. And the Pope over and over again says, we start from the wrong place if we start from an idealized form or vision of marriage, but we start with the reality of two people, often who enter marriage with complex, wounded histories who have all sorts of personal dimensions to their lives that don't make the life of grace any easier, but are called and blessed to be creative of a new reality with and through the grace of God. So there's an understanding of the depth of marriage, which I'll come back to in a bit, which I think this synod is a great opportunity to explore a bit more. In facing reality, we also see and acknowledge that that human relationship breaks down. And so the two realities that are also there for us to hold in heart and in mind are the pain and the distress of the breakdown of a marriage and the emergence and the celebration of new relationships. Now, I think the word that is coming through, certainly with Pope Francis, certainly with Cardinal Caspar and others, is the importance of the word discernment. We should never forget that Francis is a Jesuit, and therefore discernment of the movement of the Spirit of God is very central to his daily life. Familiaris Consortio, now for those of you who don't know, that was the apostolic exaltation that followed the last synod, which was focused on marriage, and was published, I think, in 1982, if I remember, by uh, Pope John Paul II. That asked us as priests to distinguish well, discern well, between all the variety of circumstances that contribute to and emerge from 
the breakdown of a marriage. And I think pastorally, we, priests are increasingly sensitive to those issues. And Cardinal Casper, in his contributions, is asking us to discern well the difference in the situation of people who have entered into second relationships. So there is a great deal of reflection and discernment to be done in that whole area of marriage and its indissolubility when it is fully embraced and affirmed. And then, as you all know, in the discernment of the invalidity of marriages on second look, as it were. Okay. My third point is about the family, because we approach marriage in this synod as the basis of the family. And I think the points I want to take to Rome are very much about the support that the church uh, is encouraged now and challenged to give to the family. And that's where a lot of Elizabeth's work lies. I think what comes through to me, and I think it's in the Instrumentum Laboris as well, that support for the family can rightly take its shape and its starting point around the children. And when we do that, then that gives us kind of a, a freshness of approach that what the church wants to do is be in partnership with the parents of this child to bring everything that God wishes in a new life to its fulfillment. So every child is a new start, and every child, therefore, is rightly to be nurtured in the best possible way. And the church would want to be committed to that in practice. And I think that means two particular things that we see in this instrumentum laboris, that there are strong invitations there for us to think about, and I will take these up, that you know, this focus on the child therefore opens the care of the family, because it is to do with the child, to families of all sorts of different shapes and, and, and configurations. And it includes grandparents too. So we don't, I think the, a, a, an important part of the support that we want to try and envisage for the family is to break down any isolation that families often today find themselves in. A second part of service to the family is indeed preparation for marriage. And given what I said earlier, it's clear that as well as focusing on the human reality of the relationship, preparation has to also focus on opening up and inviting a couple who intend to marry to do so with a full understanding and intention of how the church sees and wishes them to celebrate their marriage. So in other words, to understand marriage as a, as a sacrament and to see each other as instruments of grace and all that that requires. And then the third point under the heading of the family is that it is clearly part of the vision of this synod to reflect on the family and encourage the family as a witness in society. So the family as an actor, an actor in passing on faith, in actor, an actor in making concrete and credible the compassion of God, the mercy of God, and particularly the, the, the work of uh, support and response to those who are most in need in a neighborhood or in a community. They're the points I will take with me. Uh, I think what is, just as a final word from this opening comment, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, Catholics throughout the world are asked to pray for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for this synod. So that's a very important moment. And Pope Francis has already proposed for us two patron saints for this synod. One, Pope St. John XXIII, and the second, Pope St. John Paul II. 
And you will remember, I'm sure, that at the moment of their canonization, he said, these are the two people who will guide this synod. And he put two markers down. One, he said, is, Saint, is Pope St. John the Twenty Third, And he described him, if you remember, as a guided guide, a guide of the church who was always open to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And then he put down a second marker, which was Pope John Paul II. And he said, he is the Pope of the family, the teacher of the family. And he put down these two markers, I think not in a straight line, but kind of slightly apart, and saying, there's the space that we must enter and explore prayerfully and faithfully. And I hope our people in the parishes this Sunday will pray to those two saints and ask their guidance on the work of the church in this very important moment of its history.